<laughs> I'm just starting to think of all the little tiny plastic stuff in in different places that that yeah, just really floss, even. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> It's everywhere. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. This week on Big Feet, I'm drowning in plastic, and why is it worse than Tribbles? Here to help me out, Victoria Beal. Okay, so I did a really, really rough calculation of my carbon footprint for 2019, and I needed some help understanding it, so I called up a friend. So... Victoria, you've been eliminating single-use plastics from your life and using your Instagram at Environmentoria, it'll be in the show notes, to focus on making these and sort of other nifty tips that you've picked up along your journey more available to everyone. And I know we're going to have to talk about my physical footprint of, you know, plastics and trash, but first, I converted my rough carbon footprint from metric tons to pounds, and I don't, I don't like that number. <laughs> Because pounds, like, in, like, I know how much a pound is, right? Right. A metric ton is kind of hard to envision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I don't have, like, a quite a good, like, visual on, like, saying, oh, it's this skyscraper tall or whatnot. But um, I worry that it is kind of a skyscraper because it's um, 22,921 pounds is what I came up with. Whoa. I bet a lot of that was from air travel. Uh, o- over half of it is, yeah. So I guess I take this number which I feel like is really big, and I know... It's bigger. Yeah. Yeah, wow. So it's really crazy because we think about in a series of a couple flights, we have used 5.4 times the amount of energy as I use in my apartment for an entire year. Wow. How much How much is from your car? <laughs> so um, I did a couple... Well, I was driving up and down between LA and the Bay Area pretty much all year. Oh. And I did a couple, more than a couple trips up to Oregon. And back in February of 2019, I did that road trip all the way to Canada and back from LA. Wow. Yeah, so I ended up driving a little under 20,000 miles in the year. And that's with an, an energy efficient car, right? The Prius. Yeah, so that equals out to uh, around 8,063 pounds of CO2. That is really much lower than I was expecting. Yeah, it's great for 20,000 miles. Uh, still not great in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> but I know from reading your Instagram and having you as a friend that this isn't the full picture. So jumping over to the other foot, I know you've been focusing a lot on information surrounding our physical footprint. So what do I need to be investigating and considering on that side of this? Yeah, I love that way of framing it as a physical footprint because, again, I think it, it starts to become really abstract. Like I was saying, like really any object <laughs> is something with the carbon mm-hmm. footprint. Um, and the way I, I mean, I personally choose to think of a lot of this in terms of just like the physical waste it generates. Um, I guess like, you know, when we're talking about footprint to me, it has a lot of connotations of like energy and energy usage. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that is still like really abstract to people. Like even, you know, like what does, what does 16,000 pounds of carbon like really mean? Um, Yeah. Like I have no idea how to visualize. I have no idea. Is it it a skyscraper? Is it a house? Is it? (laughs) Exactly. What is that? What are its effects? But I think when you think about things in terms of the, physical product of waste that you're producing it's much easier for people to conceptualize and relate to um Mm -hmm. and can also have a huge impact right yeah it's it's really attainable for a lot of people it is certainly not attainable for everyone i don't think everyone could realistically live like a zero waste lifestyle but for people um like you and i who are you know members of the middle class um coming from like a relatively like well to do like background these are things that are just really easy to do um Mm -hmm. something that i'm particularly passionate about is food waste um not just the actual wasting of food itself you know we waste 30 percent of the food that we produce um but all of the things encompassed in it 
six out of the top seven most commonly found plastics, like in our oceans and on our beaches, are things that come from food. So we're talking the plastic cups, the straws, the cutlery, the um, like styrofoam packaging that your bell peppers come in, um, like uh, bags, takeout bags, um, chip bags, bottle caps, coffee stirrers, coffee cups. Um, those by far and away make up the majority of the plastic waste that we create. And wow. it makes sense, right? Yeah. Like what is the thing that every single person on the planet is doing the most every single day? <laughs> That's what we're built to do. <laughs> you have to do it. Yeah. And we got it. It's the one. <laughs> it's the one thing you got to do eating and drinking. Yeah. Um, so the amount of waste that is being produced from that is just like truly mind boggling. So I think, if there's only one part of your life that you could choose to focus on for reducing your waste, that's the part to focus on. Hmm. And then, yeah, like when you're out in the world, like when you're purchasing anything, you know, like really anything you consume. So um, clothes, books, records, like just like any object that you own has a carbon cost to it. That's a really good point. Everything has a carbon cost, and I guess we're just lucky enough to be able to know what that is now. What else should I be keeping an eye on? So I think another important thing for you to be looking at is food, right? So when we're looking at like some of the leading causes of climate change, right, there's a lot of rhetoric around the consumption of meat um, because meat farming has led to like a ton of um, deforestation. It's just really resource intensive, um, you know, you have to grow a lot of crops to feed the animals and then the process of actually like slaughtering and transporting animals as opposed to plants um, is a lot more intensive. So the carbon cost of be- consuming an omnivore diet, I think is really important. I think there's a significant difference between someone that eats all varieties of meat versus someone who is even just pescatarian to someone who is vegetarian to someone who is vegan. So obviously a lot of the really like hot millennial conversation has been around the straw, right? The war on the plastic straw. And that is without a doubt important. I personally am just not a person that's ever used straws very much. I was going to say, like, I feel like the only time I used straws is they put the drink on the counter and it already has one in it. Exactly. Like I get a Jamba Juice and they have a straw. It's good that there's attention around this particular piece, but it's really like coffee cups, like a lot of cups, um, cups and bags, really. I have the tops, the UN, um, what they say are the top seven found pieces of garbage in the environment, cigarette butts, followed by plastic bottles, bottle caps, like grocery bags, plastic bags, takeout bags, coffee cups, and then straws. Straws are the seventh most common. Oh, okay. So we're at least attacking one of those, the lowest of the top seven, it sounds like. The lowest of the top seven. Thankfully, a lot of cities are starting to ban plastic bags, but coffee cups? Are you talking about like a like a paper Starbucks cup? Yes. So pretty much all drink cups that are quote unquote paper are typically lined with a film to make them more um, like heat resistant or like less prone to tearing. And that is almost always some sort of plastic that then renders them unrecyclable. I, I thought it was like a wax type of thing on the inside. Nope, it's plastic. No, really? Yeah. Damn. I feel like I've been lied to. Yeah, it is. And I think there's a lot of greenwashing in the food packaging industry. You know, you've probably mm-hmm. seen such a rise in like those compostable plastic cups. You know, they've got cute little green leaves printed on them and you're supposed to not feel guilty throwing those away. Oh, yeah, I know those. I, that So they're just straight up plastic? It's Pretty much. I mean, I think nine out of 10 companies, it's like a, some sort of modified plastic. It's not like a true bioplastic and even bioplastics mm-hmm. are. So compostable plastics are really problematic because they're only compostable under really specific conditions that many, many cities don't have the infrastructure to support. Really? I believe San Francisco is actually one of the cities that does. Um, I read this awesome article the other day from the New York Times saying how San Francisco is like 80 diverts 88% of its waste compared to the national average, which was like 30 something. Nice. Okay. So, you know, your standard compost pile is able to take care of plant matter Mm -hmm. pretty easily. You, if you want to start taking care of things like meat and bones, I'm sure you've probably heard like you need a really, really big, really hot 
compost pile. Yeah, I've heard. And the same goes for these like really rigid bioplastics or like compostable Hmm. like cloths and things like that. Like they just need larger, hotter compost piles, which a lot of cities don't have because it requires like some serious like industrial infrastructure to support. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I was assuming like, you know, that all the city composts were going to be, you know, these big, robust, really hot, tall, steaming piles of, you know. um, That's if your city has compost, right? True, right, yeah. And then if it ends up in a landfill, then it's effectively just another piece of trash. Like, things don't compost on their own in the landfill. Oh? Composting requires very specific conditions. It's not just, like, you throw a banana on the ground and it's going to become soil. Mm -hmm. Um, Like... Compost requires like oxygen and nitrogen rich materials and like other organic matter to support the process of becoming compost. Hmm. So in a landfill, you've got a lot of inorganic matter. So it's pretty much impossible for things to compost there. Gotcha. So looking at our figurative or even literal banana in a landfill. It's going to break down, but it's not going to become like a healthy, usable soil. Hmm. I understand where like the good intention is coming from with bioplastics, but it's still better to just use a reusable alternative. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing eliminate single use plastics and I'm on board, but I mean, we've been talking about how prevalent they are and how they're just everywhere in our lives. So how did you approach this? Cause it feels kind of daunting. Yeah. So I definitely took a much more radical approach than I think is like, reasonable possible or desirable for (laughs) a lot of people i think i kind of purged everything at once um and not to say that like i was doing an excellent job before but like i definitely it wasn't as drastic of a change for me as i think it would be for a lot of people Mm -hmm. um just because you know i'm a single person without kids yeah um but yeah so i started this whole thing by participating in the Plastic Free July Challenge um, last year in 2019. And I just sort of started exploring around on social media, reading a lot of blogs of, like, quote-unquote, zero wasters. Um, It's the zero waste community, it's called. And seeing what they do and, you know, starting with some of the really easy stuff. Um, There's this awesome store called the Package Free Shop. It's a, like, women-run business that just sells household items like entirely without packaging like you go to the store and like you just can buy like a soap bar like nothing no paper Hmm. nothing, just like a naked soap bar oh my god i forgot about that too my my soap comes wrapped in plastic i didn't even think about that i know right like you think you're winning and there's always some sort of caveat to it so frequently so when i started this like plastic free July challenge like every day I tried to, like every day or every other day I tried to focus in on a new subject and I would adopt whatever okay. change it is yeah. I was a, like <laughs> I'm just starting to think of all the little tiny plastic stuff in in different places that that yeah I just really floss even oh god <laughs> <laughs> it's it's everywhere <laughs> Oh no. Okay. Um so the big things I can be doing then. Yeah, I think the step is just taking a look at what you have, thinking about what you actually need. Hmm. I think, you know, sort of going hand in hand with making not just substituting what you have with a reusable alternative, but also considering where there's space to reduce, right? One of the other big 3 hmm. Rs. And I guess also once we figured out what we need and replace it with a sustainable option, we're finishing what we already have and making sure we're not just throwing it out. Exactly. Because then then you're just wasting stuff. And I think it's also important to consider like the end of life cycle for all of your items and how to dispose of these things responsibly. Like you can't just put a deodorant stick in the recycling and it's going to get recycled. Like that's considered an object that can't be recycled in traditional recycling. So figuring out how to responsibly dispose of the things you have and then taking the step to taking stock of just what you have, what do you use every day before you start to make switches. And I guess the the sort of (laughs) selfish economic argument is that it's actually cheaper as well to reduce, right? Yes, that's an example of something that was immediately like a ton cheaper for me. Um, 
I think the thing that is difficult about going really ham on all of these switches all at once is that it's a really large upfront cost, but in a lot of ways, like I've already gotten like more than that amount of value out of it. And I would argue that every single sustainable switch is going to be cheaper for you in the long run. It's just whether you're willing or able, you know, to front that cost. So I I feel like I kind of have a list that I'm walking away with. (laughs) Yeah, I think you'll find that it's one of those things that really snowballs really quickly. Like once you've made a couple of changes and if you're really going with the mindset, that this is something that's important to you, you're going to just find so many other things that you want to change and start to get creative with the like alternatives you could be using. Mm -hmm. I think also just the important thing to always bear in mind is, you know, don't, you don't need to buy stuff like you were saying that doesn't have a place in your life. So don't go around buying a bunch of cool new like eco-friendly gadgets if like it's not realistically something that you're actually going to need or want or use. Just tying back in that theme of like reducing where you can. <laughs> That's an important part of it. And it's good to know that I don't have to go full off the grid hermit in the mountains living <laughs> off the land in order to be better or close to maybe neutral. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, I think it's really important to remember, right, the term sustainability, right, is mm-hmm. all about sustaining. Like, What do you need and what can you get that's just going to help you continue to live your life in as seamless and as least trashy as you possibly can? <laughs> and, you know, there's always going to be ways in which we can be better. And once we have governments that are actually, you know, making these much more accessible to people, um, the world's just going to be a better place. I know I have a lot of work to do, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I feel like we're starting in a really great place and I have my homework. Thanks for starting me out on, on this, I guess, journey. We're going to, we'll see how this goes. It'll be great. And I'm sure you're going to find things that I don't even know about and I'm just going to keep learning. I'm excited. Thank you for teaching me all this awesome stuff. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for asking questions. <laughs> All right, we'll talk soon. All right, see ya. Big Feet is a production of The Impact and produced by me, Ian Sumner. Music is by Suru Prajari. Check out our whole publication along with our other podcasts at readtheimpact.com. See you next week.